Okay, everybody. Let us connect to the parish of the week. Okay, so let's start today the portion, the sixth portion of the book of uh, we're in the book of Leviticus. We are holding in Parish Shmini. We're holding chapter 11, verse number one. God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, uh, saying to them, so now she says, usually it means he told Moses that he should tell Aaron. Want me to tell it to them? So the trader says, the Rashi says, the Lord said it that Aaron should then tell it, should tell it to Eliezer his son. Or perhaps it only it means only to tell the to the Jews. However, the scripture says the verse says, speak to the children of Israel. Speaking to Israel is already mentioned. So Aaron is sent to tell them. And he actually says it means that Aaron was to say to his sons, to Eliezer and to his son who in turn would tell it to the children of Israel. So Moses told it to, it says Moses told it to, uh, to Aaron. Then he uh, repeated, they re, he, Aaron repeated in front of Moses to Eliezer and his summer. And then Eliezer and his son repeated, repeated in front of Moses and Aaron to uh, the elders. And then the whole process till ultimately every single person learned the law. Verse number two, Dabo Meneso, speak to the Jewish people, Lamer saying, This is the animal that you're allowed to eat, Mikol, Abeima, Shakal, Oretz, and from all the animals that are on the earth. Now she says, Speak to the children of Israel. God made them all, namely Moses, Aaron, Leaz, and Sami, equal messengers for relaying the following speech. And why did Aaron and his son deserve such a special honor? Because they all equally remained silent, accepting the, the, the God's decree when he put Nadav and Aviyu to death. With love, they accepted it. Zoysa Chaya. Chaya is a living creature. It denotes the concept of Chayim. Since it is, Israelites cleave to the God, and therefore they're worth their being alive. Only God separated himself from uncleanness and decreed the commandment upon them that they shouldn't eat certain animals. They were prohibited, Jews are prohibited to eat certain animals. Further, the other nations, however, he prohibited nothing. This is comparable to a physician who went to visit a patient who was incurable and allowed him to eat anything he wished. We went to a patient that was recovery. The you know, physician imposed a certain restriction of his diet and ensure that the recoverable patient would live. So too the nation of Israel are called living, and therefore God asked them to not eat certain animals. Zoisachaya, this is the animal. And it says the word zois, I mean somebody was pointing at it. Teaches us that Moshe would hold up the animal and show it to, to explain them exactly. What are we talking about? This one you may eat, this one you may not eat. This one you may eat following even the creature of the water. He held up every species and told them exactly because how do you show the fish? All the different fishes, all different birds, etc. Zoysachaya be called behema. What Ashi says when it says chaya in behema, chaya is a, is a non domesticated animal. And a behemoth is a domesticated animal. That's the under, so chaya usually said, means an undomesticated, undomesticated animal, like a deer, or like a, like, a, like a giraffe. Giraffe is kosher. It's not a domesticated animal. A cow is usually called a behemoth because it's a domesticated animal. So usually a, a, a behemoth is bachlal chaya. A behemoth is part of the Animal chaya is part of the animal kingdom. That's called a chaya. So chaya is usually given a name for all animals. A behema is usually given to a cow, uh, a domesticated animal. So these are the signs of a of a kosher animal, whether it's domesticated, whether it's undomesticated, like a wild goat. 
Homa freshes parsa. Any animal that has cloven hooves, split hooves, which is shas shasha, and uh, when it says double, means completely split into double hooves. The shas shasha is a maligator. I'm sorry, the shas shasha is completely split into double hooves. Maligator, which brings up its cud. That one you may eat. Now she says, my freses, the word my freses means the concept of split. Parsa is plante in Hebrew, meaning soul or hoofs. So parsa is a hoof, my freses is split. With shesha shesha, shesha means the hoofs is completely separate from top to the bottom in two nails. That's not mean that there's no, no connection. The tiger went to red of a and tough and means split into hooves, split two hoof sections. Because there are animals whose hooves are split at the top, but not completely split and separate into two separate sections. Since the bottom section of the hoof is connected. So therefore the, the top is, is split, but the bottom is connected, it's not kosher. It has to be split, totally split. Maligator. It brings up and regurgitates the ingested food from its stomach, return the food to its mouth in order to thoroughly crush it and grind it thoroughly. So Rashi's cud, this is the name, the name of the food that animal regurgitates. It's possible it stems from the word root nager to drag or to flow, as the word says, in the water which flows. For the regurgitation f- f- food flows back to the mouth. So it flows back to the mouth a couple of times. So the animal needs to regurgitate it and eat it. So it goes into the next stomach. I believe a, a animal can have three stomachs, four stomachs. So it goes from one stomach, comes back to be regurgitated, goes back to the next stomach. And it needs to be a couple of times chewed so that the food should be able to ultimately travel from stomach to stomach. The behema, this in the animal, this is an extra word from which to derive that if, they, if a pregnant animal is slaughtered properly, the fetus inside the mothers is permitted to be eaten by behema in the animal. They allow to eat an animal that's in the mother's stomach. If, I, if you would slaughter an animal and you find a child in the stomach, it's still a kosher. You can actually eat it according to Jewish law with the shechita of the, of the, of the, of the mother. That you're allowed to eat. However, this is a negative inference, not already included in the explicit prohibition. You must not eat, notwithstanding the positive commandment here, so that one who eats unclean animals transgresses a positive and a negative commandment. The negative inference of the positive commandment. So you have, in essence, by not eating, by eating non kosher, Torah tells you you do two, two, two negatives. One negative that you're eating an unkosher animal. Another negative is you're not eating kosher. And that's a, the, the negative of the positive. Verse number four. Mara gave this, you should not eat from the one who brings up its cut. And the, those who have cloven hooves. The camel. The maligator, a camel brings up its cut. But it doesn't have a completely cloven hooves. Tamiu lachem is prohibited. As a shafan, a hyrex. So here you have a picture of a hyrex. These are the animals. This is a hyrex, according to this book. That's a hyrex. A shafan, a hyrex, because it brings up its cud. A hyrex does chew its cud, but it doesn't have hooves. Unclean. At a nevis, a hare. Like a, a hare is a rabbit. A rabbit. At a nevis, which is a rabbit. Uh, because it brings up its cut. A rabbit does chew its food a couple of times. Well, fish lay a fish, but doesn't have any hooves at all. It doesn't chew its food hooves. Mayhu lachem, it's improved. It's a chazir and a pig. Is also, uh, it does have split hooves, uh, a pig, 
The Shesa and the suffice. If it doesn't, and it's, I mean, Shesa and the suffice has completely split oaks. You will gain a leg, but it doesn't read good. It's cut. It's, it's, it's cut. The Meyahulachan. So here are the four things you're not allowed to eat that has one and not the other. This is one of the, this is one of the unbelievable statements of the Torah that they haven't found another animal in the world that has one and not the other. Only these four animals. A camel, a camel, a hyrex, a hare, and a pig that has one and not the other. This is one of the unbelievable things of the Torah. They haven't found an animal since this was written that has one and not the other. And that's the four animals that are, you would think, oh, they have one sign, like a chazer, a pig who has split hooves. So it has a sign, the feet are kosher. You would say that it's kosher, but it doesn't chew its cut. And therefore a pig is not kosher. And so too a camel. A camel uh, has, uh, uh, chews its cut, but it doesn't have split hooves. So you're not allowed, it's not kosher. Verse number eight. So you're not allowed to eat from these animals. I mean, self is an animal that doesn't have split of and doesn't chew its cud. You're not allowed to eat from it like a lion. Doesn't chew its cud and doesn't have any split hooves. So if they're, if they're dead, you're not, you shouldn't touch their bodies because they become impure. Mayim heulachem, it's a time. The Raj says you're not allowed to eat their flesh. I only know that these animals possessing one sign of, cl- of cleanliness are prohibited to be eaten. How do we know that other unclean animals which have no sign of cleanliness altogether that you're not allowed to eat? I said that, but how do we know that? Here we can infer from a kalvachayma. This is one of the ways you learn the Torah, kalvachayma. An inference from a minor to a major. If the animal has part of the signs of cleanliness is prohibited, for surely an animal that has no sign of cleanliness, which is surely not allowed to be eaten, and a dead body becomes impure. Mipsodom, Apsodom, Ba'azoda, the scripture prohibits flesh of such animals, but not the bones and sinews and the horns and the hooves. If you will be able to take those things and use it, you're allowed to use those things that's not the flesh. Will Vasam Loisi go? As she says, one might think that the Israelites prohibit to touch a carcass. Scripture ever says, say to the Kehanim, you shall not defile. So a regular Jews ought to become untummy, unclean. So why can I touch it? I'm, a, I'm not a Kayin. Why can I touch a dead animal? So I'll become unclean. I'll go, to, I'll go and purify myself. A Kayin is not allowed to officially purify himself. So, so we know that the laws by Kehanim are prohibited from defiling themselves to a human corpse. But ordinary laws are not prohibited. Now, Kavachayim can be made, another Kavachayim. Since in the more stringent case of defilement by a human corpse, only Kehanim are prohibited. The more leaning case of defilement by the animal corpse, how much more so? So if so, why does scripture mean by you shall not touch their carcass? Why should a Jew not touch a dead animal? Means that Israelite may not touch an animal carcass on the festivals, since at these times they deal with the holy sacrifice and they go to the synagogue, or go to the temple, like these days, Pesach, when everybody came to Yerushalayim to be in the Beis Hamidosh, and if he's going to touch a dead carcass, he's not going to become defiled. Even a regular Jew, he's not going to be able to go to the Beis Hamidosh. Therefore, the Torah tells you now: be careful, don't touch when on the Yontiv on the Pesach time. Sukkot time, on Shavuot time, or when you're going to the temple in general, stick away from touching dead animals because you're going to be defiled and not going to be able to come to the base of the That is the law of animals. And now the Torah tells us the law of fish. This is what you should eat, all that's in the water. Anything that has Fins, the kashkashes, and scales. Fins and scales. By mayim, by yamim, whether it's in the, in the, in the waters, in the seas, in the cholim, in the rivers. Oisam te'chelu. Torah tells us, 
you're only allowed to eat a fish that have fins and scales. And as she says, Snafri, these are the wings, like uh, these are like the wings of the animal. And that's what the fins are. Kashkeshes, these are the scales that are fixed to it. And that's the law. You have to have, you know, only allowed to eat a fish that have fins and scales, like shark. It's prohibited. And any creature that doesn't have fins and scales. Whether it's in the seas or the rivers, the call shadows are mayim, and all those creatures that creep in the, in the sea. Call nefesh achayef, and all the living things in the water, ashabamayim, shekets elachem. They are an abomination to you. And as she says, anywhere where this word appears, shekets, it denotes the creatures of slithers and moves on the ground, like lobsters and crabs. These things are prohibited. They're called a shedex. They're called a creeping creature of the of the of the of the ocean. Verse number eleven: Shekets, the abomination lechem to you. If Sodom lay sechelu, you should not eat from its flesh. But the vlasim te shaketsu, and its dead body it would be an abomination to you. You shouldn't touch it. You'll become, you'll become impure. The Rashi says shekets elaser the vuim. The statement is repeated to inhibit their mixtures. If the flesh of an unclean water creature is mixed with the food of another type, if there's enough unclean flesh to impart the taste, it becomes totally non-kosher. In Sodom, again, now she says the Torah prohibits the flesh, but does not prohibit the fins or its bones of the animal. If there's a way to use the bones of the fish, even the bones of a non-kosher fish is not Considered unkosher. Only the flesh is considered unkosher, but not the bones. The blossom to Shaketu. This clause comes to include midgets, the bushes that are filtered out of water and liquid. One may digest these creatures together with water, but once they have been separated, that's why it's a big problem with the water to create, create these little animals in the water. And it's a big problem. So <laughs> if you cannot separate from the water, then it's not a problem. But once you separate it from the water, then you, that's why we have such a problem with fruits and vegetables today, because they have so many different kinds of things that are crawling in the, in these, in these vegetation, in these fruits and vegetables. You have to be so careful of all these animals, these slimy animals that are, uh, and there's such things that there are things that, you, that even in water you can put under the microscope and you can find certain things that are, are uh, yibushim, these little things that are, are going uh, swimming around in the water you're drinking. Verse number 12. Anything that doesn't have fins, the kashkeses, and scales, the mayim, in the water, shekets with so what the, that's a repetition. Now she's going to say, this is a repetition. We said it already. What does scripture come here to tell us? In verse 10, it said it already stated, any creature that have its fins and scales are abomination to you. However, without this verse, one might think that in a water creature is permitted only if it brings up signs of the cleanliness, namely fins and scales, into the dry land. But if it shed them in the water, how do we know that that creature is still permitted? That means, let's say there's a certain animal, there is a certain, I forgot the name of the fish, that loses its, 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 its scales. It loses it in the water. Scripture, therefore, says that creatures that don't have fins and scales in the water, that means even in the water, that they never had fins and scales. If they had fins and scales, but they lost it in the water for whatever reason, then those fish are permitted if they lose it in the water. Verse number, verse number 13. That's These are among the birds, you shall hold these in abomination. You're not allowed to eat the eagle, Vesa and the griffin vulture, the kite, and an osprey. 
verse number, well, the Rashi says, um, Lo yacheli, you should not be eaten. Scripture is telling us that one may not feed them to minors, derived from the passive verse, be eaten, meaning that these birds may not be eaten through you. Or pass him not, not so. But it's telling us that the additional not eating them, one may not derive any benefit from them. Scripture just said, you shall not eat. And the active voice teaches us that one is prohibited from eating them, but is permitted to derive benefit from them. You can sell it to a non-Jew who eats non-kosher. So you can derive benefit to them. Not, you see, milk and meat that are together, you're not going to have any benefit even from it. If you mix milk and meat together, it has to be thrown out. But a non-kosher animal, you can sell to a non-Jew. You can have benefits from it. That's why the Torah tells the Torah keeps on emphasizing that you're not allowed to eat it. You're not allowed to eat it, and you're not allowed, of course, to be eaten. So you cannot say, oh, but a child is not obligated in the, in the mitzvahs. Maybe I can feed him non-kosher. You're not allowed to admit, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to, to do that. You're not allowed to do that. That's a don a kestrel. That's a ya. Let me know. And all vultures to their species. That's called oida. Let me know. All ravens to their species. That's basayana and an ostrich. That's a that's a tachmos and a jay. That's a shochov and a sparrowhawk. That's a nets. Limineo and a gosh hawk after its species. Rashi says the sparrow hawk. Note that according to some editions of Rashi, we're eating the oster, uh, which is which is translated in Greenberg as a gosh hawk. Vultures in modern French. This clever edition render a shock of verse as it. Leave a koyz and an owl, as a shalof and a gull, as a yanchuf. Rash says a shalof, the bird that draws up the fish out of the sea. And the meaning of the uncle is shalof, the fish catcher. Koyz as a yanchuf, the owl and the little owl. They are in French owls. They shriek at night, which have cheeks like those of a human. There are another bird similar, it's called a hibui, in French. Verse 18, Vesa Tenshemes, the bat, Vesa Kos, and the starling, Vesa Rocham, and the magpie. Now she says the bat, the, that is that's another French word. It resembles a mouse and flies about at night. The Shem is mentioned amongst the creeping animals. It resembles this one so far as it has no eyes. The one is called a palpi, French. There's a chasida, the stork. There's a nofa, after its speech, it's the minor. There's a duchvis, and the hoop, hoopy. And the, the atlet, the question of back was mentioned about it already. Now she says, Achasida, this is the white daya. It's called Zigyon in old French, Chigone in modern French. And why is it called Chasida? Because it does kindness with his fellow's birds, helps them to eat. Hanafa, this is the hot temperate daya. And it appears to me that the bird is called a heron in Old French. Aduchvis, Aduchvis is a wild rooster which has been dub, doubled crest. It's called a hiropi in French. Why is it called Duchvis? Because it glorifies, namely, its crest, its van of kofus. It combs its double and appears to be folded into a head and bounded up there. Uncle says, Nagatura, mountain carpenter, namely named for what it does, explained the 
I've explained the Gemara and Gitin. These are very interesting. Well, we don't have, so in essence, when it comes to a, a bird, we don't have the uh, exact, uh, how many, actually it's brought down the Talmud that more birds are kosher than non-kosher. In general, it's a bird of prey that are, that are non-kosher. Um, we know we only have like a certain uh, uh, amount of birds that we, that we eat, a chicken and a, and a, uh, a dove, a, uh, Duck is kosher. Um, some people don't eat turkey. The Shalah, great sage says he saw a turkey kill another animal. So he told his children not to eat turkey. Well, most Jews eat turkey. Kol shelatayv, any flying insect that walks on four, check it, hulachem, it's an abomination to you. So these Lashe, these are the delicate and small creatures that crawl on the ground like flies, hornets, mosquitoes, locusts. However, amongst those are flying creatures that walk on four, you may eat. When those that have joint legs, like extension above their le regular legs, which hop on the ground. So here's like the picture, the picture of this locust. The picture of this locust right over here. Its legs go higher than the body. And like a, it looks like extra legs. So now she says the above meaning the higher uh, most <laughs> some is the actually eat today locusts, but it's very hard. Most Jews don't eat locusts because there's a lot of different kinds of locusts, and certain of them are kosher and certain of them are not kosher. So this meaning is that the Rashi meaning the higher the creature's body, namely near its neck, it has two legs like extension besides its regular four legs. And it wishes to fly, it hops from the ground. It bolts itself firmly with these appendages and flies. In our region, we have many of sorts of flying creatures called lagostu, sea locusts, but uh, we are no longer proficient in identifying which one is clean and which one is unclean. And what specifically, what sort of problems we have to, in, in their identification. There are four signs of cleanliness in Nun regarding these creatures. A, four legs. B, four wings. C, kralasim, which are joint legs like extensions described above. And D, wings that cover the majority of the body. All these signs are needed to be found in the creature among us today. But some creatures have long heads and do not have tails. The reddening is that some have tails. They're not be the name Chagav. So in this requirement, namely, which type specific officially Chag and which is not, we no longer know how to distinguish between them, and Ashi says. And therefore, we don't eat locusts. We don't eat locusts anymore. Verse 22. So from this locust category, you may eat the following, the red locust after its species, as a flom, and the yellow locust after its species, as a chargal, and the spotted gray locust, as a chagov, and the white locust. Verse 23, any other insect that has four legs is an abomination to you. So now she says, why do they keep on Torah seeds saying four legs? Now she says that, that the Gemara says that if that's five legs, it would be permitted. Verse number 24. All those, if you touch the dead bodies, Yitma, the other of you become impure until the evening. The Cholanesis of Verse 25. Anyone who carries their carcass. Yechab is begadav, he has to immerse 
in a, it would, in his garments, the tummy had the other, and he becomes unclean until the evening. So that's it. any place scripture that mentions Tumas Masa, unclean is required by carrying an unclean, it's more stringent than Tumas Maga, than touching something. So you have Masa, when you carry it, you have to, you have to clean your garments too. When I touch something, my garments don't become impure. Verse 26. Any animal that has cloven hooves, and which does not bring up with God, they are tummy, they are unclean animals. But on a gay event, whoever touches them, it comes and clean it. And, Dead. Now it says, for the instance, a camel who split hooves, whose hooves is split on the top, the bottom is connected. If Kipti teaches us that the carcass of an unclean animal defiles, on the section at the end of the verse 39, scripture explains that a carcass of a clean animal defiles as well. However, scripture deals with these separately since there is a difference between the two. The case of a clean animal, its carcass defiles only if it dies, but not if it's slaughtered properly. Even if it's a trefa, it is a fatal disease or injury, its carcass is not defiled. This is derived from the verse 39, which reads, if any animal normally die, eats, dies, meaning only when it dies, its carcass defiles. So basically, a, a non-kosher animal that's dead, if you touch it, become tummy, become impure. A kosher animal, only if it died, do you become into impure. But if you shechted it, if you slaughtered it, you don't become impure. We eat, we eat animals that are slaughtered. We don't become impure for eating it. Because once you shechted it, it's, it doesn't make no impurity comes to it. But if you if it died, or you found a dead cow on the side of the road. Since it died a natural death, it becomes impure. Verse number 27. Any among animals that walk on four legs. Any animal that walks on its paws is like a dog. He's unclean to you. Anybody who touches the dead body, you, know, you don't become impure touching a live dog. You become impure if you touch a dead dog. Or a cat, whatever. Al kapo can color like a dog, bear, or cat, tiger, lion, walk on four. To me, him lachem, they are tummit lamaga to touch. And they said, Some lost if you touch them, not even touch them. Verse 28, you carry them, their dead body. You have to wash your clothes, you have to wash your clothes. It's a cleanly clothes. But tell me, Adarab, you become impure until the evening. They are unclean to you. Verse 29. And these is the unclean for you among the creeping creatures that are creep on the ground. The weasel, the mouse, the toad, after its species. All these creatures of uncleanness are not referring to a of eating, but rather the actual uncleanness meaning. So a person will become unclean by touching them, and he will consequently be prohibited eating truma, a portion of one coat is given to the kohen, and holy sacrifices for entering the sanctuary. Khaled is a weasel. Hatsav is a frog. Verse 30, it's Anoka, a hedgehog, a koya, and the amalan. Vesatola and the lizard, Vesachemish and the snail, Vesatishemis and the mole. Rashi says it all in French. I all these things have its French name. Verse thirty-one. These are the ones that are unclean to you amongst all the creep, creeping creatures. Anyone who touched them when they are dead will be unclean until you. Verse 32, if any of these dead creatures fall upon anything, they become unclean. 
Anything that it will fall onto, whether it's a vessel, a garment, hides, or sack, any vessel which work has been done, it shall be immersed in water, but will remain unclean until evening, and then it will become tar. So I have to go to the mikveh, and it has to be tummy a complete day. It's still even after immersion, it still remains unclean until Ada Arev, until the evening. Afterwards and afterwards, with Tarab out of Shemesh, it becomes clean when the sun is set. That is the end of the, today's portion. We learned all the laws of kosher, non kosher. We now go to the Tanya of the day. We're holding chapter 41 of Tanya. And then the Alter Rebbe continues. Alter Rebbe had stated earlier that a person's intention while performing Torah mitzvah should be that his soul pleased to God. That should be in a person, that should be your kavana. General intention is that you want to connect to HaKadosh Baruch with this mitzvah, you want to connect to God. How now, how he now goes on, on to say that a Jew's spiritual service also includes the goal of becoming one with all the Jewish people. Another purpose in Torah mitzvahs, and that is to unite us. For this reason, his intention should not be limited to having his own soul cleave to God, but also that the source of his soul and the source of all the souls of Israel cleave to him. By doing so, the individual brings about a union of the higher and the lower levels of godliness, knowing as Kuchabrichu, the Holy One, blessed be He, and His Shechina, divine presence. For the former is the source of the Torah mitzvahs, and the latter is the source of all Jewish people. That's you'll see this statement before the Baruch Shama. L'shem yichud kutcha b'rishchur u'shchinta. He's doing it for the sake of the unity of the kutcha b'rishchur, the Holy One, blessed be He, and His shchina and the presence of God. It's fine by many Jews. They'll say these words very quickly before every bracha they do. L'shem yichud kutcha b'rishchur u'shchinta. For the sake of the unity of the oneness of God. God is above the oneness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is the source of all Torah and mitzvahs. Ushchinte, the, the shchina is the presence of God, where the presence of God comes connected to every Jew, and to bring these two concepts together. This explains that the concluding phrase of the formula recited before the performers of certain mitzvahs for the sake of the union of Kuchabrich and Shchinti in the name of all of Israel. Shame call you so. As the Rebbe notes, in the name of all of Israel <clears throat> implies that the union achieved through the performance of mitzvahs is for the sake and the name of all of Israel. That means when I do a mitzvah, I don't do it only for myself. I do it for everybody. For the sake of the entire Jewish nation. For it's the Shechina that the Kuch is united. And the Shechina is a source of all Jewish souls, as the Alter Rebbe, as we'll see in the Alter Rebbe's words. So when we do a mitzvah, we unite the entire, I, when I do a mitzvah, I unite the entire Jewish nation with God. So let's learn the words of the Altar. Oh, no, yet in fact, Om Rabbi Sein who's a chrenel of Racham, our bled, the, the sages of blessed memory said, La oilam la yalt a yotze Adam a man should never ever separate himself from the community. And I cloud. He should always be part of Cloud Yisrael. And how does he do that? 
Kal Yisrael, on the whole world. How do I become part of the entire Jewish nation? Therefore, he should intend to unite and attach to him, bless him indeed, the source of his divine soul, which is the source of his divine soul and is the source of all Jewish souls. Which is the source of the Spirit of God, which is compared to the speech of God, which is called the Shechina. The Shechina, there's many names to it, Malchus, like the aspect of kingship. Melech Melech al Yisrael, king of the Jewish nation. Why do we call it Shechina? Because it's the way it encloses itself in the world to give them existence, to give them vitality, to animate them, animate them, and to give them existence. He, he, Amashbas, and the Shechina, and it's the Shechina which is imbues him with the power of speech to utter the words of Taita, or with the power of action to perform the commandments of Taita. That's what it's brought down. That thus, like God created the world with speech, so too we create the world through speech. And when we speak divrei taita, we bring down a spiritual, a spiritual creation in the world, whether through our speech or ultimately through our actions. and this union. Source of the Jewish people with God by day This is accomplished through drawing down when we do a mitzvah, when we say words of Torah, we're drawing down this light. We're drawing down this oil of this light of God. I the through the words of Torah, our mitzvahs. Why? Who move it them because it clothes itself, the light. I and mean, when I learn Taita, I'm creating a garment for this light. The light needs a garment. And the words of Torah is the garment of this light. The mitzvah is the garment for the light. And that's really that what I have to have kavana. The kavana is Ham Shokha The kavana in every mitzvah is the drawing down of this light. That's the whole purpose. The mitzvah, that's what Chassidus tells you, mitzvah, which translates commandment. But really, mitzvah is not the commandment. It means connection. Mitzvah means connection. also means commandment. It means connection. Stops of a Because through a mitzvah, I'm connecting the godliness and the physical world. And therefore, I should have that kavana. That I'm bringing down godliness to my to myself and to the entire world, the entire Jewish nation. And I should intend in drawing his blessing light over the source of his soul. And not only the source of my soul, it is Fashis Kol Yisrael. And I want that through this mitzvah, I bring a light down on the entire Jewish nation. That's why, in general, you look in our prayers. We never say, Rafa'ini, heal me. We say, Rafa'inu, heal us. Barech Aleinu, bless us. We always say it in plural because it's not only about me, it's about us. And I will explain this. This union I will explain later at length. This is the meaning what we say. And I said we say this every day in the Baruch Shama. We say the shame yichud kuchabricho shrimte for the sake of the union of Kuchabricha. Blessed is name Ushrinte in the presence of God. The shame call Yisrael in the name of the entire Jewish nation. 
So let's learn the box of it. This is the say, one's observance of the commandments unites the source of the Torah and the mitzvahs with the Shechina in the name of all of Israel, for the Shechina is the source of the soul of all of them. The Alta Rebbe now notes that, the much, that much more than the union of the divine soul, the, that of the divine soul and God is accomplished by Torah study and by performance of mitzvahs. These activities also bring about Tokat Hadidim, which means the tempering or the sweetening of harsh judgments of Gvura and their transformation into kindness, Sadr, into kindness. This is affected through the pulse gaining of the supernal spheres of Chesed and Gvura, bringing these two things together, bringing the two things together of kindness and severity. These fittest, which by nature are opposites, are fused into one through revelation and the diffusion of the divine light, which is spiritually superior to both of them. Which in general is that when we're connecting physical and spiritual, spiritual is chesed and physical is gevura. And now to diffuse them is a great accomplishment. This light is super, supernal, will be drawn down upon the two attributes to the performance of Torah mitzvahs, in so much as Torah mitzvahs are expression of divine will. The spirituality far surpasses the spirituality of the spirits of Chesed and Gevura. When divine will, the source of the, of the supernal kindness, is revealed through the Torah study and the performance of mitzvahs, the attribute of kindness and severity are united. And severity is transformed into kindness. It's a beautiful concept. That's expression. Just like God makes peace in, in the upper world between Chesed and Gevura, because God is greater than both of them, and it brings unity between them, so too may our service bring unity between these two concepts. Because we're serving God who's above Chesed and Gevura and he had to keep, and, and, and the Abish is above these two attributes brings unity in two things that are seemingly total opposites. That's what Dr. Rebbe said. Thereby, by days, a yimtuku gamkeng vudas bachasodim and melam. Through the performance of Tayyip Mitzvahs, the Gavuris will of themselves be sweetened by the chasodim through the, the unity. Scalus, I don't know right. I don't, I'm not, I don't know how to say that English fancy English word. Scalus is through the through the mixture, amidus of the attributes, the yehudam and their unity. So they're in in like in the world of Atzilus, where there's a great revelation of wisdom. Over there, Chesed and Gevura are united. So when we learn Torah, we reveal Eden Saif, even higher than Atzilus in the world of emanation. And since we reveal such unbelievable oides, then things that are in the world that are gavura will become sweetened automatically. By the means of the revelation of the supernal will. Which revealed on high through the stimulation from below, from my stimulation. So through I, my, me and you, we do Torah, and we do mitzvahs. Through that, we will sweeten all the things that are happening in the world. Namely, it's revelation here below in, one who occup- in, in one's occupation in Torah mitzvahs, for they are the, as blessed will. This is a very interesting thing that the Alter Rebbe gives us a way in this world to sweeten all severities. That even though everything is good, but there has to be some, some, some sweetening of the severities. And the way we do that is by connecting to something that's higher than this world. Higher than Chesed and Gevur in this world, that is God. 
And we connect to Kodesh Baruch Hu. We connect to God through Torah Mitzvahs. Automatically, the severities are going to disappear. As it's brought down in the Rabbi in Kabbalah, the Mishnah's Chassidim, the Mishnah's of Chassidim tracted Arachampin, chapter to Kabbalah. Shtayag mitzvah atayra, mishachos mechavurid the Arachampin. 630 commandments of the Torah are derived from the whiteness of Chassidim, of Arachampin. Purots and Elyon, which is the supernal will of God, is the Kabbalistic words, Makar Chassidim. Which is the source of all kinds. So when a yid does a mitzvah, when a Jew does a mitzvah for the sake of the unity of God, he doesn't do it for his own. He has, the Altarev is giving you a meditation in why to learn Torah, in why to do mitzvahs. If we do it, we do it without intention. We can't sweep into severity. That's why some things in the world are severe. But if we do it with kavana, we do it for the sake of heaven. We do it with the intention of the sake of heaven. Then we have the capability to sweeten all severities in this world. Because we bring down a light, we infuse a light in the world. From the higher worlds, we're over there is a source of all chesed. So really, Gevur in this world is also chesed, but it's in this world, it's seemingly very bitter. We have to go to a deeper world. And that world, once we reveal the, the light of that world, then chesed, the Gevur, that we, it becomes sweet and we see, we see the negative the severity of the world disappears and the true sweetness of this is revealed. So here the Alta Rebbe gives us another very powerful way that what Kavana does. Kavana having intention and what's the intention of every Torah that I do and every mitzvah that I do, my intention should be to connect to HaKadosh Baruch I'm doing this the shame Yechud Kutcher B'Nechushinta I'm doing it for the sake of the connection with God, where God is, a, so to say, spiritual and above, and the way he can come down into a physical. And the way that these two entities can become as one. And through that, I not only do it, bring about an infusion of godliness in my life, but I bring a fusion of godliness in the whole Jewish nation. Because I did it for the whole B'Shem Bo Yisrael. I did it for the sake of the entire Jewish nation, which are all one soul. We all come from one God. And now, I sweeten also all Gevuris in this world. I sweeten all severities in this world. What a beautiful Tanya of the day, my friends. Today is the 20th day of the month. The fifth day of the Omer. Today, the 20th day of the month, which starts on chapter 97, I believe. Yes. Chapter on times on chapter 97, and it goes to chapter 103. 97 to 103 in Tillam, and you would have done the chitas of the day. I want to wish you all a good Shabbos and a good Yantiv. This Sunday is Yontiv, Achen Shal Pesach, a very special day. It's also the day we say Yisker, and also the day we celebrate the Suda of Mashiach, the Baal Shem Tev inaugurated to make a Suda for Mashiach. We're going to have it over here in Shul, if you want to come outside. Seven o'clock, we're going to celebrate with Mashiach, Be'ezat Hashem, and we'll all have a beautiful Yontiv and a beautiful Shabbos, and the Chitas will again Continue on Monday morning at 8 a.m. I wish you all a wonderful Shabbos, a wonderful Yantiv. God bless us all. The dust like we went to the Mitzrayim and years ago. May we still go out of Mitzrayim today when we all go yeah. back to the Holy Land.
‫בכל מיני משיח במהלו בימינו ממש. ‫אמן. ‫-Good job, everybody. ‫-Good job. ‫תודה, רבי.